The following is a CUNY TV special presentation. Good evening. My name is Chase Robinson, and I, as president of the Graduate Center, have the privilege of welcoming you to tonight's event. For joining us, I'm grateful to you, our audience here at 365 Fifth Avenue, to those of you watching and listening online, and to my colleagues from across the university. I'd like to extend a special welcome to Chancellor J.B. Milliken and Michael Bloomberg, founder of Bloomberg LP and Bloomberg Philanthropies, and three-term mayor of New York City. Now, that tonight's conversation should take place here at the Graduate Center is no coincidence at all. The Graduate Center is an incubator of discussion, critique, and debate, all reflected in our doctoral and our master's programs, our 30-odd centers and institutes, and in the dozens of events that take place here every week. Above all, the Graduate Center is the source of an ongoing stream of research, the kind that informs policy and shapes the way we approach some of our biggest challenges, tonight's topic among them. Now, generating this work are the GC's world-class faculty, students, and scholars, two of whom will join us on the stage later on, Phil Kazanitz and Les McCall. The caliber of the Graduate Center's research engages peers such as Raj Chetty from Stanford, whose bold study highlights CUNY's success. It's also put to good use by journalists such as David Leonhardt of the New York Times, who's our moderator for tonight's activity. Above all, it's the product of real disciplined knowledge transmitted and multiplied through proven expertise and intellectual honesty. And as I reminded our graduates earlier this year, it has never mattered more. No one, I think, is better qualified to counter what most imperils us, inequality, environmental risk, alternative facts, than those for whom empirical data are the building blocks of reasoned debate. Now, on the subject of inequality, the Graduate Center is proud to boast some leading researchers and experts. The world's most important income database and resource lodged in the Stone Center for Socioeconomic Inequality, and also in collaborations with our CUNY colleagues. The Graduate Center is very proud to play a pivotal role in the extraordinary project that is CUNY. Every year, our doctoral students teach more than 200,000 undergraduates in nearly 8,000 courses. In so doing, they bring the very best research and learning to virtually every neighborhood in every borough. No other university propels the kind of mobility that we'll be discussing this evening than ours. Now, I'm sure our next speaker will agree in just over two and a half years, Chancellor Milliken has developed multiple initiatives to improve access to higher education in New York City, especially for underrepresented groups and the city's most vulnerable youth. He scaled up innovative programs to ensure high graduation rates. He's expanded efforts that provide workplace experience and significantly increased support and scholarships to military veterans. He's provided greater access to undocumented students known as DREAMers, and also to students who've been in the foster care system. Finally, students from the correction system who are re-entering our communities. On a personal note, his support of the Graduate Center has been demonstrated especially vividly over the last few tumultuous days following the executive order on immigration. I want to thank the chancellor and all of our colleagues at CUNY, indeed all of our colleagues here at the Graduate Center, faculty, students, and staff, for help 
us to secure the successful re-entry of our student, Saira Rafie from Iran. Our resolve and our advocacy made it possible. With that, please do join me in welcoming Chancellor Milliken. You know, I'm back in the uh, green room. I can't hear what's going on here, so I assume Chase introduced me. So thank you for that introduction, Chase. Um, so we're uh, delighted that you're uh, here this evening. I want to add what I suspect were Chase's thanks to our distinguished panelists tonight and to David Leonhardt for leading this timely and important discussion. And while this may not have been the intention of Raj Chetty and his colleagues, or David when he wrote about their work, we thank you for the extraordinary marketing work on behalf of the City University of New York. I can't, I can't imagine a louder and more rewarding shout out uh, to CUNY uh, for the work that it does every day to fulfill its mission. The remarkable mobility research we're discussing tonight is tremendously important. The stakes are extraordinarily high and they're rising. Support for public universities is largely declining across this country at the exact time when we know that the knowledge economy requires and rewards diplomas more than ever. There are legitimate questions to be asked about which universities do the job best and why, primarily so that we can all learn about what steps can be taken to best prepare more Americans to be successful. And the recent research of Dr. Chetty and his colleagues makes an enormous contribution to this debate. It addresses a vital, if sometimes uncomfortable, question. Does higher education perpetuate economic inequality or break it down? Are universities meritocracies or instruments that support a status quo? In short, are the oft-repeated claims about the value of higher education in providing the means for ordinary Americans, no matter what their income level, to achieve their dreams, supported? I think I know the answer at CUNY. For the City University of New York, no discussion could be more important since economic mobility is central to our special mission. CUNY was one of the country's earliest and greatest experiments in using widely accessible education to advance the goals of mobility and opportunity beginning in 1847. Each succeeding generation has had to, in effect, reinvent and update the CUNY experiment to keep pace with the changing demographics of the city, fiscal challenges, and shifting economic demands. But the goal has remained central to who we are today. So consider today, for a moment, Faiza Masood, an outstanding student who will graduate from Hunter College this spring. She's the daughter of Pakistani immigrants. Her father works in a candy store. She never enjoyed a family vacation, but her family certainly gave her support, and CUNY gave her opportunity, which she seized. She recently was chosen as a winner of a Marshall Scholarship and will be doing graduate work at Oxford next year. And while Faiza is a singular young woman, she is by no means alone. CUNY is filled with students who have the ambition and talent to strengthen our city and our country generation after generation if we open the doors of opportunity and mobility. About 40% of CUNY's 245,000 undergraduates were born in another country. And at this moment in our history, that's a statistic I can't get enough of. A similar number of students are the first in their families to attend college, and more than half are from households that report earning less than 30,000 a year. It's quite gratifying that the mobility study generally demonstrates that CUNY and its colleges do so much to advance our mission and that it's done on such a remarkable scale. The other statistic I can't get enough of today is a line from David's piece that captures the remarkable achievement of CUNY that we propel nearly six times as many students from lower to middle income levels and above than do the eight schools of the Ivy League, MIT, Duke, Chicago, and Stanford combined. But don't get the idea that we're satisfied. We're not. 
The mobility research could not have come at a better moment for CUNY because days later we launched a plan that says, in essence, if you like what CUNY's done for economic and social mobility in the past, you're going to love us in the future because we're doubling down. Our plans will rely on investments and strategies that I'm convinced will significantly, and in some cases dramatically, improve CUNY's performance on the kind of metrics important to this new research. Our starting point is Governor Cuomo's Excelsior Scholarship Program, which extends the benefits of free tuition to many more New Yorkers. And our plan focuses on many areas that will contribute to our students' success. Our students need to be better prepared for college, graduate earlier, and connect more deeply with the people and institutions that will help them launch great careers. To accomplish this, CUNY must leverage its strengths in new ways and work even more closely with the public schools in New York, more effectively move underprepared students from high school to college, and partner with the private sector so our talented, ambitious students will have the same opportunities as those from more privileged backgrounds. The stakes are exceedingly high, and the results of our work will mean many more people enjoy the mobility that college can provide. I'm delighted we have this important new research to help convince policymakers of the importance of an investment in public higher education. So I thank you for being here. I thank again our guests this evening. Welcome to CUNY, and we look forward to tonight's program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chancellor Milliken. It's now uh, a great pleasure to introduce a special guest, someone who knows a thing or two about tackling big issues. Michael R. Bloomberg is an entrepreneur and a philanthropist who served three terms as mayor of New York City from 2002 until 2013. The list of accomplishments during that period is dazzling. He cut crime by more than 30% created jobs by attracting new investment and supporting small business growth, launched initiatives to fight climate change, and implemented ambitious public health strategies, including a ban on smoking in restaurants and bars. Through these and many other efforts, Mr. Bloomberg helped increase the average life expectancy of New York City residents by three years. His education reforms drove high school graduation rates up more than 40%. New York was also the only major city in the country not to experience an increase in poverty between the 2000 census and 2012. After leaving City Hall, he returned to Bloomberg LP, the extraordinarily successful company he founded in 1981, while also devoting more time to philanthropy, which has always been among his top priorities. In fact, Bloomberg Philanthropies distributed more than $600 million to various causes and organizations, and that was in 2016 alone. Please join me in welcoming Michael Bloomberg. Hello. Good evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Chase, thank you for that kind introduction, although I will say I couldn't hear it from the back. But I just assume that it was. Anyways, I hope you've all had a good Monday and that you weren't up late, too late last night watching the Super Bowl. Uh, if any of you are Falcon fans here, all I can say is just be glad you're not a Jets fan. I thought it was funnier than that, but that's okay. Um, I did want to thank CUNY for inviting me to introduce today's presentation because its focus couldn't be more important. Uh, the American dream is based on the idea that with hard work, anyone can build a brighter future and give their children a better life. We are a country built on the uh, equal opportunity, not equal results, and equal opportunity, if it's not really made equal to everybody, then you don't get the kind of results that you do want. Uh, for many Americans, unfortunately, the dream of doing better, or having your children do better than you are, uh, is fading and fading fast. It's more out of, they're, it's sl slipping out of reach. And more and more good-paying jobs require advanced skills, but unfortunately, 
too many schools are not teaching our young people. Uh, the parents' income still does, uh, goes, does far too much to determine whether a child will go to college, and we can't accept that America is not the land of opportunity. We want to make sure that it was uh, exactly what we've all grown up to believe it was. Uh, I want to applaud uh, CUNY for uh, bringing us here to share ideas. In a moment, you're going to have the pleasure of introducing, of seeing a real star, uh, Raj Chetty. He's an economics professor at Stanford. For those of you that don't know, that's a small school on the West Coast. Um, he's the author of a study that, among other things, looked at the, which colleges are most successful in helping students from the poorest 40% of America enter the top 40% of incomes. And amazingly enough, the study found that five of the top 10 most successful in the country are CUNY schools. And that's something that everyone at CUNY should be very proud of. Yes, it is. <laughs> Chase and I were talking about before, why do people, why are people surprised about that? Um, if you think about it, CUNY was the Harvard of the average person for many, many years, starting back in the 20s, 30s, and uh, fell on some tough times. But certainly, this is a school system that's come back and made enormous progress. Um, uh, the uh, Raj's study also highlighted some very disturbing facts. For instance, it found that less than half of 1% of students from the poorest 20% of families attend any of the nation's most selective colleges. So it says that poor kids just don't have a chance to get into the good schools, even though many of them do have the grades to do so. America is the world's greatest meritocracy, but if you're attending a college uh, that depends more on family income than on hard work and talent, something's broken, we have a responsibility to fix it. Not every one of uh, every qualified student will want to attend any of these schools but many more would if they did have the right resources and right knowledge. Schools with predominantly poor students have an, on average one college counselor for every thousand students. Think about that. One uh, guidance counselor for every thousand students. Obviously, they don't get any help whatsoever. And partly as a result of that, more than half of qualified students from low-income families don't apply to selective schools, and many don't apply to college at all. And our foundation is working to help change that through a program that we created called College Point. This program hires mentors to help students with applications and financial aid, uh, either online or over the phone. And so far, we've reached something like 22,000 students. We're also working with college presidents to help them find ways to attract and graduate more highly qualified, low-income students through what we call the American Talent Initiative. So we're working on both the supply and the demand side. Our growing group includes public and private schools, big and small, in every part of the country, and we share recommendations with other schools. Helping more students attend good colleges is really critically important, but so is making students graduate with the skills to succeed in careers. And during our time in City Hall, we worked to prepare high school students for jobs in growing industries, including science and engineering. And I'm happy to say that CUNY has also emphasized those fields. And as the largest public university in America's most international city, CUNY can help ensure that people from all backgrounds can compete for those jobs. The Grove School at City College is one of the most diverse engineering schools in the nation. And given the times that we are in, it's worth remembering who that school is named for. It was named for a guy named Andy Grove, who was a great City College alum who passed away last year. He was a founder of the computer chip company Intel, and he served for years as its CEO and chairman. But he never forgot just how much CUNY did to launch his career. And in 2005, he donated $26 million to City College to help more students bring their dreams to life. But I will say that Andy Grove was not the only innovator. He was not only an innovator, he was a distinguished CUNY alum, and he was also a refugee. Uh, back in 1956, he was one of the thousands who fled the Soviet Union, uh, re the Soviet regime in Hungary. Uh, our country and CUNY gave him a new beginning, and he gave so much back. And uh, we just cannot forget that our country uh, became great by welcoming people with big dreams, 
regardless of their race or nationality, and then helping them bring those dreams to life. 40% of CUNY undergraduates born in another country, and that's about the same population as New York City overall. So many great CUNY alums come from immigrant families, and that includes Secretary of State Colin Powell, whose parents came from Jamaica, uh, CUNY graduate Jonas Salk, the inventor of the polio vaccine, who was the child of immigrants from Eastern Europe, and I think the list just goes on and on. The fact is, we need more immigrants, not less. And our next speaker, who was born in New Delhi, is a wonderful illustration of why that's true. He is a MacArthur Genius Fellow, and before switching to Stanford, was a Bloomberg Professor of Economics at Harvard University. Now, you may be wondering how he got such a cool-sounding title, and I will tell you, uh, some years ago, seriously, I made a gift to help Harvard create the Bloomberg Professorship. It was the first gift that I gave to Harvard where I went to graduate school, and it was to support teachers doing cutting-edge work on the big issues facing our country, particularly philanthropy. And each year it goes to a different school at Harvard, and the dean of that school can appoint anybody they want, but it's for one year. And they typically would use it for a junior professor before they decided whether to give that professor tenure or whether that professor is just passing through. I can't think of a better example than our next speaker, uh, Raz Chetty. So it is a big pleasure to uh, introduce him now. Uh, I did listen to his presentation about an hour ago at my company. It's fascinating, the numbers that he's come up with. And what I think it does, it says that we can make a big difference in this world if we pull together, if we welcome immigrants, if we give people a, a hand up as opposed to a hand out, uh, and if we just uh, uh, open our eyes that uh, no one person has all the good ideas. Ideas come from every place, and we want to make sure they come here to America. Uh, sometimes we can get depressed when we look at some of the national elections, uh, but it is still a country, when people vote with their feet, they still come to America, and um, while we're not perfect, I think we've got to also be at the same time very careful to not get down on ourselves. It's still the land of opportunity. Raj, all yours. Congratulations. <laughs> Thanks so much for the wonderful introductions. It's really a pleasure to be here at CUNY, an honor to, uh, to take the stage here today. So I'm gonna talk about uh, higher education and upward mobility, but I'm gonna start first with broad motivation for these issues by talking about a, a trend that I think should be really concerning to all of us, which is the fading American dream. So this chart here plots the fraction of children who earn more than their parents at a comparable age by the year in which they were born, starting with 1940, where we see that more than 90% of kids born in 1940 in America did better than their parents did. Then going forward over time, you see that the American dream of upward mobility has gradually faded such that for children born in the 1980s, it's essentially a coin flip as to whether you'll do better than your parents. I think this trend lies at the center of many of the national challenges that we're seeing today uh, and is something very concerning going forward. Now, in thinking about how to revive the American dream, there are numerous different channels that you might think about, the neighborhoods in which kids grow up, the schools that they attend, and so forth. But I think many of us naturally look to higher education as an important pathway to upward mobility. But to date, there's been relatively little systematic data on which colleges contribute the most to helping children climb the income ladder. And so in this study that uh, I'm gonna discuss today, uh, we show how colleges shape upward mobility by constructing what we call mobility report cards for every college in America. <clears throat> and what those report cards give us are statistics on parents' incomes and students' earnings, outcomes, for every college. We use de-identified attendance and income data for basically every American college student, about 30 million students from 1999 to 2013, obtained from the Department of Treasury and the Department of Education. So to start, let's begin by examining how access to colleges varies with parents' household income. And I'm gonna jump into the data by showing you this chart here, which shows you as a frame of reference what access looks like 
at Ivy Plus colleges, so Ivy League and other comparable schools in terms of selectivity. So what this chart is plotting is the fraction of kids at these Ivy League schools that come from each percentile of the parental income distribution. So there's one dot uh, for, for each of the percentiles, 100 dots on this chart. And what you can see is that access to Ivy League colleges is incredibly skewed. 14.5% of kids at schools like Harvard and Stanford and Yale come from families in the top 1% of the income distribution. That's more than the total number of kids who come from the bottom 50% of the income distribution. So there's a tremendous concentration of very high income families at these elite schools. Now to take one example here in New York, uh, Columbia fits this pattern uh, very well. It's very representative. You see that 5% of kids at Columbia come from the bottom quintile of the income distribution. 67% of kids at Columbia come from the top quintile of the income distribution, about 15% from the top 1%. So now let's look in contrast at CUNY, looking at the entire CUNY system, including all four-year and two-year colleges combined, and you see a very different distribution. You know, this is consistent with what I think you're all familiar with. CUNY, as David put it, is more of a working class college. Nearly a third of students come from the bottom quintile of the income distribution, families earning less than $25,000 a year, and you see a considerable share of students from the middle class as well. And so just to start, you know, in order to create mobility, you have to give access to children from relatively low income families. And so CUNY, you can see, is clearly doing that. Now, the next step in terms of creating mobility is that you also have to deliver good outcomes for students in adulthood, right? And so let's now examine students' earnings, measuring kids' earnings when they're in their mid-30s, which is what we're able to do in currently available data. And the way we're going to look at this data is ask what fraction of students from families in the bottom fifth of the distribution make it to the top fifth of the distribution. So there are many different ways in which you can define mobility. They tend to give, give you similar answers. Here we're going to use that kind of Horatio Alger version of rising from the bottom to the top quintile. So what does that look like? Again, uh, at CUNY, and here I'm going to focus on one particular CUNY college, Hunter College. And so here, first, just showing you the bars representing access uh, as a reference. And you can see at Hunter College, 21% of students come from the bottom quintile of the distribution. So let's now ask what fraction of those low-income kids end up making it to the top 20% of the national income distribution. That is, when they're around 30 years old, earning more than $60,000 a year. And you can see that at Hunter College, about 36% of kids end up making it to the top fifth, conditional on starting in a family in the bottom fifth. Now, an interesting pattern, which turns out to be true not just at CUNY, but at all colleges we look at, is that kids' outcomes don't vary very much uh, with respect to their parents' income, conditional on the college they attend. So that is to say, kids from high-income families and kids from low-income families do just about as well as each other at CUNY and at most other colleges in the United States. And so that, I think, is quite encouraging because it shows that CUNY is quite effective in leveling the playing field between kids from high income and low income families. Kids from low income families appear to be able to overcome the disadvantages they may, may have had in childhood and have similar rates of success. So what I want to do next is put together the measure of access, the number of low income kids at each college, with these measures of success rates, how well those kids are doing, to construct what I'll call a mobility rate. That is, what fraction of students at a given college start poor, that is, come from a family in the bottom fifth of the distribution, and end up well off, that is, end up in the top 20% of the uh, income distribution. Now, that mobility rate uh, can be computed as just access times the success rate. So to take an example, at Hunter College, we saw that access was 21%. 21% of kids came from poor families, and 36% of those kids made it to the top 20%. So that means that the mobility rate at Hunter College is 7.5%. The way to interpret that number is that out of 100 students at Hunter College, 7.5 started poor and ended up rich, okay? So now let's, as a, as a frame of reference, now let's compare that to all of the other colleges in the US. And I'm gonna show the data for all the colleges in the US uh, using this plot here. So on the vertical axis, is the success rate, 
how well kids do, uh, conditional on starting in a low-income family, and the horizontal axis is access. So again, just to remind you, at Hunter College, access is 21%, the success rate is 36%. So now let's bring in all of the other CUNY campuses, and you can see that there's this cloud of points, all with relatively high levels of access uh, and fairly high uh, success rates. And you can see variation between these colleges, as you might expect. So for example, the two-year colleges like Queensboro and Kingsboro tend to have higher levels of access, but lower levels of success rates, all right? So now, as a comparison, let's now contrast this with all the other colleges in New York City. And uh, you see that the CUNY colleges are, tend to be in the upper right portion of this chart, right? They tend to have relatively high access and relatively high success rates, which is what contributes to high mobility rates relative to other colleges in New York. So the average mobility rate for the CUNY system is 7.2%. That's more than twice as large as the average mobility rate for all the other New York City colleges. And so, if, you know, why is that? You have some colleges like Columbia and Princeton that have terrific outcomes, the best outcomes essentially of any college in the US, perhaps not surprisingly, but they admit such a small fraction of low-income kids that they move very few low-income kids to the upper part of the income distribution. At the other end of the spectrum, you have certain community colleges in New York that have lots of low-income kids, but don't have very high success rates, and as, as a result, they also don't have very high mobility rates. So CUNY has that relatively unique combination of admitting lots of low-income kids and having quite good outcomes. And then finally, we can bring in all the other colleges in the United States represented by the gray dots here. And you can again see how much of an outlier the CUNY system really is relative to the entire spectrum of colleges in the US. So to, to summarize that data, we can look at the top 10 colleges in America by these mobility rates. And this is the statistic that Mike Bloomberg was referring to. You see that this list of top 10 colleges by mobility rates is just dominated by CUNY with Baruch at the top, City, Lehman, John Jay, uh, and so forth. Uh, the average college in the US has a mobility rate of 1.9%, mean, meaning that less than two kids comes from a low-income family and ends up at the top. CUNY ends up you know, at somewhere around 7, 8%, far, far higher than that. Now, it's also useful to contrast CUNY with peer institutions, other state university systems or publicly funded university systems. So this chart here shows you mobility rates for four-year state college systems looking at the top 10 four-year state college systems. And you can see this is just using the data for CUNY four-year uh, campuses. And you can see that the mobility rate there is 8.3%, really just dramatically higher than all of the other colleges, including SUNY. Uh, you would have noticed in some of the earlier charts that Stony Brook looks quite good, but still not quite at the level of CUNY in terms of mobility rates because access is not nearly uh, as high. Similarly, among two-year colleges, the CUNY two-year colleges look distinctly different from other state systems. The last set of data I want to show you is how these patterns are changing over time. And so while I think the statistics I've been presenting so far are very positive and are good news, I think when we look at the data over time, there's reason for worry. So are colleges like CUNY continuing to provide ladders to opportunity for, for low-income kids? So this chart here shows you the fraction of kids from the bottom 20% of the income distribution by year from 2000 to 2011. Uh, and what you can see is that the fraction of kids from low-income families at CUNY has been steadily declining over the past decade or so, uh, where it was over 30% in 2000, and now it's somewhere around 23%. You see a similar decline at SUNY Stony Brook. Uh, it, it, meanwhile, at Columbia, which many of you might know enacted significant efforts like many other Ivy League universities to increase financial aid, you actually don't see very much of a change at all. And I think this sort of trend is quite worrisome because it implies that CUNY may no longer be providing uh, ladders of opportunity for as many low-income kids as it was in the past, perhaps because of tuition increases, budget cuts, and various other pressures that many state university systems are facing. So we see similar trends like this at a number of other public institutions that offered high mobility rates uh, in the past. And you can also look at the data 
by uh, CUNY College, and you see declines at essentially every CUNY campus with the most dramatic declines, a 10 percentage point reduction in the fraction of kids from poor families at City College, Lehman, LaGuardia, and so forth, but really uniform declines across all institutions. And I think that's something to be concerned about and try to address going forward. So I think the, the key questions for us as researchers, and I think for all of you in the audience and for policymakers, should be to think about how we can preserve or hopefully increase access to institutions like CUNY for children from low-income families. Another question we're uh, investigating in collaboration with um, researchers at CUNY is why mobility rates at CUNY are so high and how we can learn from the experience at CUNY to replicate and expand that success at other institutions. And in particular, I think it's important to distinguish two explanations. Is it that CUNY is particularly successful in selecting upwardly mobile students thanks to its population of immigrants we heard about and others who are striving to move up in the income distribution? Or is it that studying at CUNY increases a given child's chances of success because of the nature of teaching and instruction and mentorship offered at this university? I think distinguishing between those explanations is very important because if we want to understand how to replicate these successes elsewhere, we need to know whether it's something about instruction or the types of students attending these universities. More broadly, for those who are interested, all of the data that I'm presenting here for CUNY and all other universities in the US can be publicly downloaded uh, from this website. So let me end by coming back to the trend that I showed you uh, at the beginning of this fading American dream. Uh, as Mike Bloomberg noted, I myself am an immigrant. My parents came to New York City in search of the uh, American dream. And I think the type of America that they were looking for uh, was what we saw in the 50s and 40s in the US where kids really had a chance of succeeding uh, relative to their parents. I think institutions like CUNY continue to preserve that American dream for many kids today. And I hope this institution will remain a, a beacon of inclusiveness and opportunity for all. Thanks very much. Thank you, Raj. Thank you all for coming. Um, we're excited to dig in and talk a little bit about these results. Um, and I'm joined not just by Raj, but two of our faculty members here. Next to me is Leslie McCall, who's the Presidential Professor of Sociology and Political Science, and also the Associate Director of the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality, which is really doing some fine, fine work on this topic, um, both about the United States and around the world here at the Graduate Center. Um, Leslie studies inequality and opportunity and also public opinion about those issues. And there's some really interesting interplays between all of that. In the middle is Phil Kazanitz, who is the Presidential Professor of Sociology, um, also here at the Graduate Center. He's the author and co-author of many works, including Inheriting the City, The Children of Immigrants Come of Age, which received the American Sociological Association's Distinguished Publication Award recently. Um, and we've already heard Raj's introduction. I want to start, Raj, where you ended, which I think is a question on a lot of people's mind where they, when they see this work and invite everyone to talk about it, which is this question of cause. To what extent is this really causal? And I think of this as kind of two different questions, but please push back if, if any of you think that's wrong. The first causal question is, is the question of, is college worth it? Would these kids do just as well or almost as well if they didn't go to college? Um, and actually, college has to clear a higher bar than that because they're t you're taking four years out of your life. Um, you're often spending money. When I look at the data, I find it to be quite overwhelming that college is worth it that we don't see any kind of upward mobility like this among kids who are not getting college degrees. Do you think that's a fair reading of it? Or is there more room to say, eh, maybe if you're 18 years old and you come from a working class or low income background, um, you can still make it uh, without, without racking up debt and spending four or more years of your life in school? So I'm happy to start. You know, I think that's absolutely a fair reading of the data, David. I mean, there's evidence from prior work, which I think shows clearly that attending college is worth it for, for many kids. To take one statistic from our study, if you do not attend college, your chances of rising from the bottom 20% to the top 
or something like 4%. In contrast, remember the numbers I was showing you for CUNY, your odds of rising from the bottom 20% to, to the top 20% are on the order of 30% uh, conditional on attending CUNY. Now, obviously, that's not a comparable set of kids, the kids who didn't choose to attend college and the, and the, and the kids who attended CUNY. But nevertheless, I find it hard to believe that none of that is the causal effect of attending college. I think attending CUNY or perhaps another uh, comparable institution uh, has dramatic effects on kids' long-term outcomes. Yeah, I mean, there's also some really interesting research comparing among uh, the children from families that are the least likely to go to college, comparing those who do end up going to college <coughs> to those who didn't go to college. And that gap uh, between those two groups in earnings when they're adults is actually much greater than the gap in the earnings between the children who are from those families that are very likely to go to college, right? So those ones who are likely to go to college, they did go to college, and those who are likely to go to college and didn't go to college, pretty small gap between those. So it makes the most difference, in other words, to the very children that do well at a place like CUNY. And it particularly makes a difference at CUNY. I was just going to uh, give a small plug for a book by one of my colleagues here, Paul Atwell, called Passing the Torch, which was a study of the first generation of really open admission students in the 1970s. And what's quite remarkable is that at almost every stage, additional college ended up making a difference for those people and f eventually for their children. Um, college graduation was an enormous advantage. But just attending college, even if they didn't graduate, was also an advantage. Community college graduation was an advantage. Really, every year they spent at CUNY uh, and ended up increasing incomes and had positive uh, results for their children as well. I find that the data and the academic work that y you've cited to be quite persuasive on this. But I actually, to me, the most persuasive version of this comes from Mike McPherson, an economist and the president of the Spencer Foundation, um, who says, Find someone who starts to question the value of college, a journalist um, who's writing articles saying college isn't worth it, someone at a think tank, um, and ask them whether that person is going to send their own children to college. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that tells you what you need to know about uh, the value of college. Exactly. So the place where I find, and you basically said this yourself at the end, but the place where I find this squishier is the, is the cause of any given colleges, yes. right? And so, um, uh, so is it that the colleges that look the best on yours, including a lot of CUNYs, are doing something fundamentally different? Or is it, to be clear, that we are in New York, right? And New York happens to attract, for decades and decades, a lot of really talented, driven immigrants, whether their last name is Chetty, or Wong, or Sheehan, or Korsnick. That's the story of the United States, right? And this is a magnet unlike any other place. And so I guess my, my question is, should we go into this? You've said you want to do more work to try to answer this. But should we go into this thinking that it's more likely to be predominantly a CUNY effect or prominently an NY effect? Mm -hmm. So I think that is certainly a squishier question and, and the question to be answered going forward. So first of all, I think it can't simply be in New York City effect because there are lots of colleges in New York that have much lower mobility rates than CUNY, as we saw in the chart that I put up, either because they admit much fewer low income, fewer low income kids or because they have much lower success rates. So I don't think it's just a given, you know, given the population of New York that you're gonna see very high mobility rates. So CUNY must be doing something uh, right. And what, so you know, it, it could either be that the students who are being admitted to CUNY are uniquely qualified and highly upwardly mobile, or it could be that, you know, as we'd put it, that there's a lot of value added from uh, attending CUNY because of the particular instruction uh, that it offers. Now, piecing apart those explanations is what we hope to do uh, going forward. One thing I will note, which makes me think that uh, there is a lot of value added here, is if you look at the observable characteristics of the students admitted to CUNY in terms of SAT scores and right. other factors like that, it's not like they look dramatically better than other institutions that have much lower mobility rates. So that makes you think perhaps there is something quite special about attending CUNY. How, just from a methodological standpoint, can you, is there a way to give us a sense for how you're going to try to tease that out? Yeah. Uh, so one of the things we're hoping to do, uh, working with folks here to get access to data that CUNY has, 
is look at people who were admitted to one of the CUNY four-year colleges or missed a threshold for getting in, and you can compare the kids who just got in with the kids who just didn't get in, or look at the kids who, for various other reasons, ended up going to some other college. So essentially, you have a control group and a treatment group, and then using this earnings data, you can compare their experiences and ask, what is the causal effect of attending CUNY for a given child? The thing that when you look at colleges like CUNY, I also mentioned the University of Texas at El Paso, a whole bunch of the Cal States, a lot of these colleges that look really good on this. The, the thing that I, where it seems to me these schools have room for internal improvement, we'll get to the politics and the budget funding in a minute, which I would think of as external improvement, mm -hmm. is on the graduation rate. The graduation yes. rates at a lot of places, including a lot of CUNY campuses, strikes me as an outsider and a layperson as lower than I would hope it would be, which is to say there are still lots and lots and lots of kids who come to these places and don't ever get a degree. Uh, am I wrong to think that? Should we instead think, look, these kids just don't have the preparation? Or can places like CUNY, and I say this to all of you, can they, can they do more to try to have more success stories, and what would that be? Well, I, I will say, first of all, you're completely right. The graduation rate is a real problem at CUNY. Um, it has improved, and, um, but that only is um, indi indicative of just how terrible it was when I got here in the 1990s. Um, I would definitely think there are a great many things that we can do internally to improve the graduation rate. CUNY does not make it easy for students to get through for all sorts of reasons, and I think we're, we're doing all kinds of things to try to improve that in terms of better guidance, in terms of better course availability. One thing that I think we've improved a lot on is uh, transfer from community college to four-year college and being able to do that without uh, incurring a huge new set of requirements. Uh, that's some major reforms that we've uh, undertaken that were quite controversial in the last few years. But that has really helped an awful lot of people get through in a timely manner. That having been said, I will say that I never, exp well, I would like CUNY graduation rates to be much better than they are. I don't think they ever really should be where the best of the private schools are. Mm. Um, <clears throat> public universities in that respect are different. Whoever originally called us the working class Harvard, to some extent didn't do us any favors. Mm -hmm. Because that comparison, I'd rather be you know, the urban um, um, University of Michigan in that sense. It, it, because one of the problems that happens is if you, um, at truly elite schools, the door is uh, very, very narrow, but once you get in, it's almost guaranteed that you'll get out. In fact, it virtually takes a conscious act of will to flunk out of many of the elite schools. Um, the fact is, you know, part of the price of having both reasonably high standards and having reasonably open access is some people aren't going to make it. Now, I would like to see a much larger portion make it, and I'd like to see us be much more sensitive to that, but I, I don't want us to be held to a totally artificial standard of, of the same kind of numbers that you get at the privates. I mean, I mean, what's remarkable about these numbers, actually, is that they're not based on graduates. Exactly. It's yeah, really, right, exactly. I that's mean, important. It's, important. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, you know, that was one of the first questions I had yes. about the study, is that they cannot identify graduates, yes. and it, that sounds like uh, a, a real problem for the study. But, but in fact, it's just remarkable that you can get the results that you do without looking at uh, those who have graduated. Uh, and I mean, just a second, one thing that Phil said, which is I actually dug into some of your data to try to un better understand this question about the causes. And, uh, and I also found that CUNY is about in the middle of the pack of similar colleges in terms of SAT scores. So they're not unusual there. And they're actually not unusual in terms of the graduation rate either. They're about in the middle, and, and it's increased by 10 percentage points uh, from the beginning of your time period to the end, 2001 to roughly 2013. The graduation rate. Yes, yeah. the graduation rate, uh, which is probably somewhere on the order of a 30 percent rise in the graduation rate. Um, so, uh, so CUNY's doing remarkably well uh, on, on that, and, and, and I think we have to, I guess another way of looking at this is, is to say it's refreshing not to focus so much on the graduation <laughs> rate. There's so much focus on that uh, that we tend then to lose sight of some of the really positive outcomes. Not that we shouldn't yeah. improve 
as mm -hmm. Phil said, the graduation rate. Um, but I think that there's been a uh, focus on that, um, that that has taken away from the more positive outcomes. One of the things that's really nice about the data, because it's all public, is you can cut it your own way and come up with your own statistics. And we, over the many weeks that Raj and his colleagues and my colleagues and I were talking about their data, they would often say, we're looking at it from this angle, but feel free to, to do a different one. And you all can do the same one. One of the ones that I ended up liking was the percentage of kids who come from the bottom quintile and end up in one of the top two quintiles, right? And the success rates for the best schools like CUNY exceed 50%. And as you're saying, those are all students. So basically it's a way of saying that the kids who graduate overwhelmingly end up there and the kids who don't are the ones who aren't. That's right. Let's talk about the politics of this. The, the numbers on state funding of higher education since 2000 are just horrifying. I mean, you go state by state, and you are seeing per student inflation-adjusted declines of 10, 20, 30 percent in state after state after state. Um, uh, why is that? Why are the politics of funding education so bad, even though yeah, there's this undercurrent of skepticism about education, which I referred to, but there's not some anti-education lobby out there the way there is on many other issues. <laughs> <laughs> or if there is, it doesn't take that name. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I think on this particular issue, there's a real uh, contrast between the public views about education and the, polit the elite politics uh, of education spending at the state level and at the, uh, the federal level. Because as you said, support for increasing education spending is very high. It cross cuts Democrats uh, and Republicans. And an interesting movement at the state level, actually, California did this, Oregon, a number of states have passed uh, state level taxes on higher income households. And the way that the ballot measure is phrased, it's very explicit, the taxes will be raised on top incomes and all of the revenues will go to first thing, education. Uh, second thing would be health care. And then the third, sometimes there are uh, public safety services. Um, so the, the main thing that, that uh, those who are supporting these kinds of ballot measures at the local level are saying, we need more funding for not only colleges, but for pre-K uh, and for other uh, public schools. Um, and and, they're, and they're being, these sorts of ballot measures are being supported at the local level. So that's combining progressive taxation with support for education funding, which you don't see those two going hand in hand very often. Usually you see support for progressive taxation in order to raise revenues for transfers, income transfer programs, such as welfare. No, I think the new formula is we need revenues to fund popular programs that help uh, most of uh, the citizens of the states and of the country in you know, the 99% the um, of the distribution. Is there any way to improve the politics of funding education? I mean, people who, who want to see education better funded, which I would guess pres includes much of the audience here tonight, um, uh, are, are there ways in which uh, people who want to see that can, can think, look, these are the kind of arguments candidates should be making. This is the way to improve the politics of education? I want to give the <laughs> others a chance that I could. I mean, one, one thing I'd note is you know, while certain public institutions already <laughs> seem to have terrific outcomes, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are also lots of public institutions that you see in the data where the outcomes don't look so good. Yep. And so I think drawing the public's attention to the fact that there are some institutions that seem to be doing really well and perhaps we should be expanding funding for those institutions and actually paying attention to, to performance could be, could be valuable. Now, more broadly, there are other political currents, growing inequality and so mm -hmm. forth, that might be pushing in different directions, but I think paying attention to that heterogeneity is important. Yeah, I would agree, and I wonder to what extent the, the popular mood that says perhaps college is not worth the money and not worth the investment, how much of that has to do with the omnipresence of um, um, non-accredited private colleges, which have just grown massively in recent years, and so 
in uh, some of my research, we ended up you know, asking people questions about whether college made sense for them. And you know, the A answer, and this was among uh, the children of immigrants, was always, oh, of course, you know, college is very important. You have to go to college. But then when you pressed it just a little bit in in-depth interviews, it would always be, but I know this guy who went to college and worked really hard and got a lot of debt, and he's still working at the supermarket stacking cans alongside me. And almost always, it ended up being one of these um, for-profit colleges. And so I think there's kind of a certain degree of popular confusion uh, between those and the public colleges. And we really do have a, a great story to tell about some of our public colleges, and I think we have to tell that more articulately than we have. Since we're here in New York, I, I want to ask about um, Governor Cuomo's proposal on free college. And I, I'm really torn about it, because on the one hand, I think the idea of free college has enormous benefits, right? That people don't, th people don't fool themselves into thinking that, that cost is a barrier to college, right? And people come to understand that college is a universal thing and everyone should do it. But I also have heard some criticisms of it that, that struck me as legitimate criticisms. There's, back in the old days in media, our headlines, you, you couldn't sort of tell what the headlines were saying because they had to fit into space. Um, and nowadays with the internet, our headlines are much more direct. So actually to summarize this piece in the Washington Post, all I have to do is read the headline, which is, there is actually nothing for low-income students in Cuomo's free college plan. <laughs> um, and, and the argument for Matt Chingos, who's at the Urban Institute, is that um, basically low-income students already get free tuition. Right. And what this is going to do is it's going to give free tuition to the middle and upper-income students, but it's not going to do anything to help lower-income students with um, the living expenses, which is really the struggle for them. And at a time of rising inequality, we shouldn't be putting the resources of the state toward the middle class and upper middle class. Any thoughts? Well, it is true that a very large portion of CUNY's students, I don't know if we have the, we have the exact number, it's, it's in the neighborhood of uh, 60%, uh, thanks to Pell Grants and TAP, are not paying any tuition now. Um, so clearly I think that the Cuomo plan would have a more dramatic effect at the SUNYs. Uh, that having been said, I think the fact that if we made the case that look, college is free, you graduate high school, you know, you have decent grades, you can get into college, don't worry about it, is politically I think extremely useful for us, particularly given first of all CUNY's history and the fact that it was a free system until you know, until the 1970s, and it has that, the glory days have that kind of idea with them, and the fact that so many CUNY students live at home. So the um, question of additional living expenses is not as big a deal as it would be in hmm. some other places. Also would like to say that, and this is possibly because I'm a parent currently paying for a child in college, <laughs> you know, people in that, this fourth and fifth quintile but who are making, say, under $100,000 a year, the cost of private college these days, or public college, is still really quite substantial. So I wouldn't want to be in a situation where, uh, obviously, everything's a zero-sum game. At some level, it's all money, and you have to, you know, and I would rather see it at the lowest end of the distribution. But we shouldn't fool ourselves into thinking that people with incomes in the fifty dollars to $100,000 range have a really easy time paying for public college these days. Right. I think, David, it's hard to answer that question without knowing the opportunity cost of that money. What would yeah. you have funded had you not put the money in uh, cutting tuition for families earning between seventy-five and 125000 So, you know, if that money had been allocated to improving New York City public schools, especially for mm -hmm. lower-income kids, I think that also, if, you know, if we view the broader problem as trying to revive the American dream, I think that could go a long way, perhaps a longer way towards doing that than middle class uh, tuition cuts. So, you know, in contrast, if the money would have gone for tax cuts for people in the top 1%, then presumably would have a very different consequence. Yeah. I mean, one way I've come to think about it is if there's going to be a big statewide push on free college, and part of the point is to, the, the, the rhetorical point and the political point is to help the bottom half, it seems to me doing nothing to increase the aid for low income students right. for living expenses is less than ideal. I agreed, but again, I think one of the reasons this idea was so in, um, rhetorically effective in the Sanders campaign yep. was the very simple argument that at a certain point, American society decided that K-12 uh, instruction 
was a state obligation and something that should be free to all. And given the necessity of a college degree for advancement in today's economy, the idea of expanding that to four years of college seems like an idea whose time had come. And I think you know, the fact that this idea that really wasn't even on the political agenda two years ago, that through the Sanders campaign has become you know, something that is so talked about, uh, I think shows that it really is deeply appealing. I mean, it goes back to this question of the politics of education, and I think to a certain extent, uh, we know that universal programs are more popular programs, and right. to the extent that this extends benefits into uh, the middle class, then I think that makes it a much more universal program. And CUNY does do extremely well relative to peer institutions in terms of providing, or the state of New York does extremely well. Uh, compared to other states in, in providing already tuition assistance uh, to low-income families. So we wouldn't want that uh, to be hurt in any way whatsoever. But if you add on to that and maybe tweak it in certain ways so that some of these other kinds of expenses could be funded um, through the plan, then I think that only broadens uh, the appeal of education, universal educational reform uh, and we're seeing the appeal of that at the pre-K level too, universal pre-K uh, mm -hmm. is an example of that. So I think we want to see these kinds of initiatives happening at every single level um, in the educational hierarchy. Uh, and this is just sort of the latest version of that. Um, and, and it really is answering uh, an interest among the public uh, to shore up the American dream. And that's not something that, that only the lower class is feeling at this point. It's, it's reached into the middle class. The history here is really fascinating. And a lot of this comes from a book of Raj's former colleagues, Claudia Golden and Larry Katz at Harvard, the CUNY of the affluent, I guess I should call it. <laughs> and, um, uh, and they point out that when the universal high school movement started um, in the early 20th century in the United States, there was a real debate about whether it was wasteful. And essentially, the decision that large parts of Europe made was that universal high school was wasted. You know, why does, it, why does the children of working people need to go to high school? They're not going to ever need a high school education. And the United States made a different bet, which is, you know what, we're going to, in part because of political demand that surged up in places like Iowa, that we are going to give everyone a high school uh, education and sort of bet that it's not going to be wasted on folks. And if you think about how much the economy has changed over the last century, it seems hard to fathom that the appropriate amount of universal education in 1917 was 13 years, and today is still 13 years, mm -hmm. right? Which is definitely an argument for it. Mm -hmm. I, I think the K-12 education analogy is apt in, in more ways than one, because while you know, uh, primary education is now free in the US, it's of tremendously variable quality, right? Because yes. of the way in which it's financed. And so I think one has to be concerned about similar issues arising I think it's about more than just making college free for everyone. One has to be careful to try to give all students access to a high quality education the same way that I think that's very important at the K-12 level as well. I mentioned UTEP and Cal State. Can you just tick off a few of the other um, uh, colleges or, or, uh, or just general findings from the paper? Because there's just so much in the paper that I know it's impossible to cover in 15 minutes. Can you give us a little more flavor of, of details from it? Yeah, um, so the highest mobility rate colleges, you know, they're, they're scattered throughout the US. Uh, some of them are in Los Angeles. M many of them tend to be uh, mid-tier public institutions. So not the state flagships like the UC Berkeley's and the University of Michigan Ann Arbor's because those colleges tend to have relatively low rates of low-income access, although they have terrific outcomes. It's colleges that look more like CUNY in terms of the profile of students they admit and so forth that end up on the top of the list. I think what surprised me most, David, was that it's actually that these colleges kind of defy characterization. There's no simple correlate. It's not easy to say, oh, it's two-year public universities or four-year public universities or universities that have a certain distribution of majors or certain types of students. It's just much more heterogeneous than that. And so you know, that, to me, just really illustrates the power of having data on the outcomes and the incomes of the, of the parents at each of these schools because it's not as simple as saying we need to increase funding universally for uh, certain types of schools. And so I would say you know, that's, 
not so much a unifying theme as a lesson on how we need to explore this type of data further. The, the thing about the profile of schools like the University of Michigan and University of Virginia is really striking. I mean, if you, if you just looked at their data and, told, and asked people, are these public or private universities, mm -hmm. you would say these are private universities. I mean, they look so much more similar to Duke or an Ivy League school than they do to a school like CUNY. The one exception is, uh, that I've noticed is the University of California, mm -hmm. which is yeah. both the elite and has a student body that is really economically diverse. And then you come back to the same question of, is that something about the University of California or is that something about California? It seems like that would be one of a really promising question to try to answer if you're able to dig into the causal. Yeah, that's right. I mean, I would still say the UCs are not at the level of Cal State's no. in terms Fair. of access. Right. But there is, you know, there is one other wrinkle to the story that I didn't mention here, but I think is important to note, especially in the context of the UCs, which is that the elite private schools and the elite state flagship schools, while they tend to have similar rates of helping students reach the top 20% of the income distribution, they are considerably higher in terms of rates of reaching the top 1% of the income distribution. So if you define success, not in a broad way as we did here, which I think is very reasonable, reaching the top quintile of the distribution, but rather is reaching the upper tail, so becoming a CEO or something like that, then you see really different rates of mobility at the elite private schools because rates of reaching the top 1% are so much higher for students at Harvard and Stanford and so forth relative to other schools. Mm -hmm. Phil, I know some of your background is studying immigrants. Does this study or does other work in this vein do anything to help us answer the question about whether today's immigrants and the immigrants who've come in the last couple decades are repeating the pattern of success of previous generations of immigrants, or whether in fact they are struggling in ways that the immigrants of the early 20th century did not? Well, um, I would first take issue with the fact that the immigrants of the early 20th century often struggled as well. Fair enough. And, um, and not all groups were equally successful in an equal amount of time. You know, it's a much more varied picture. It's a picture that's very easy to telescope if you look back historically, because we're looking from the end, you know. Um, if you were to ask that question in 1935, a lot of people would say, well, some of these immigrant groups are not necessarily going to do nearly as well. Um, but in general, I think that this study certainly shows uh, mar some marked similarities. I mean, CUNY is one of the big success stories in terms of both access and uh, in terms of the relationship between access and mobility. And CUNY is one of the big immigrant schools uh, in the nation. Close to 40% of the students are immigrants themselves, not the children of immigrants, as was true in the past. Uh, when you put the children of immigrants on, I don't think we actually have the number, but just anecdotally, I'm almost certain it's the majority, uh, but are either immigrants themselves or the children of immigrants. Um, whether the you'll always get the same kind of very dramatic and often romanticized results, but results based on, it's a romantic picture based on some reality that you had in certain cohorts in CUNY's past with certain immigrant groups, not necessarily. But what, one of the things that I really appreciate about Raz's uh, 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 study was the use of the quintiles, which allowed us to look, look at the story of people coming from the bottom quintile to the top quintile rather than the 1%, uh, simply because that, you know, on a societal basis, the numbers are so much larger. You know? uh, and add to that the fact that CUNY's numbers are so much larger. I did a little back of the envelope calculation before, and uh, CUNY is approximately three times the number of undergraduates than the entire Ivy Plus group that you're looking at. So in terms of a societal impact, an awful lot of people are moving from real poverty into a fairly middle class life. Now whether we'll have the same number actually moving to really truly great moments of success, I think that you know, remains to be determined and there's a lot of things that influence that. But you know, from poverty to the middle class in one generation, I'll take it, it's not so bad. Yeah. And that's a nice segue into the last thing that I wanted to touch on. When you talk about it, you appreciated that the study had quintiles in it. Yeah. Um, I actually want to end almost on a meta point about this, um, which I think is appropriate for this audience. Uh, I wanted to ask Raj just to talk a little bit about the broader, the broader thrust of this entire work. Because I think it's important for people to understand that this is a study that simply would not have been possible 
um, uh, a decade ago. Um, that what makes this study possible is this is not a survey of 2,000 people. This is millions and millions of anonymous tax records. And it, the, it's not just this work, it's work on well-being, it's work on what areas are most likely to help people rise out of poverty. It's that opening chart that Raj showed you. Um, and I, and I just, I want to give you a chance both to talk about it and also I know from all that you and I have talked about this, how grateful you are to a lot of people in the government, in the education department, who've sort of made sure that we can learn more about policy. And Yeah, thanks David. I mean, absolutely. None of this work would be possible without the data that's underlying uh, this study and numerous other studies that we've done recently on issues of equality of opportunity. So this work, I think, is, illustrates what I see as the frontier of modern social science, which is the use of big data to tackle important economic and social policy questions, much in the same way as big data is often talked about in the private sector with Amazon and Google trying to use large data sets to improve the products they offer. So our vision is that analogously similar data sets and similar methods to some extent can be used to tackle questions like how can we improve equality of opportunity, how can we increase access to colleges for, for low income kids. In the past, you know, some of this type of work had been done, but was often based on much smaller data sets where you couldn't come anywhere close to constructing statistics for every single college in the US because you simply wouldn't have enough information on every college in the US. So, so the key here is that we're able to use administrative data that the government has in tax records, social security records, Department of Education records, all de-identified so that there's no privacy concern, we're really just interested in these aggregate statistics, but using that data because of its universal coverage covers everybody in the country, you can, in a systematic way, understand exactly what colleges are contributing in terms of mobility and other work that we've done as part of the Equality of Opportunity Project, looked at how the neighborhood in which a child grows up influences that child's chances of success. We've also done a study where we link the entire New York City public school district data to tax records in order to look at how the teachers you have in elementary school affect long-term success. And all of these studies, I think, add to, to the view that the American dream is not, it's not immutable that it's fading over time. This is something that we can change. We can change it through meaningful interventions at the neighborhood level, at the primary school level, at colleges. And I think these types of data are really critical for understanding what policies work and what policies don't. We, we spend billions of dollars trying to solve these problems, but I think, unfortunately, we often don't know which of these policies are actually effective. And so I think it's critical going forward, and I hope this will continue with the, uh, with the current administration and current local policymakers, uh, that there will be a lot of support for scientific evidence, because I think that's really important to figure out how we can revive the American dream. Excellent. Well, let me just end by, uh, by, by with two thanks. First of all, uh, as someone uh, who very much likes what I do and feel lucky that I get to do it, mm -hmm. and whose family arrived in this city just a couple generations ago, I want to take a moment to say thank you to this university for the role it's played in my own family's life, including the professors who are on stage here and all the professors and others in the audience. Uh, and I want to invite all of you to thank our wonderful panelists. For I take the opportunity to thank our presenter, our moderator, and our speakers. Thank you for coming. Do visit www.gc.cuny.edu, and, um, and I hope to, to see you again soon. Thank you.